powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Jeff Mosher is in the house today. We take a look at uh, one week into Eagles free agency. How are they doing? Are they a better team today than they were on February the 12th? Jeff Mosher's in the house from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast. And he joins me now on another edition of Football at Four, where the Eagles, obviously, I've been gone for a week, and they look like a completely, well, I don't say completely different team. They brought back a lot of faces. They brought in some new ones. Jeff, what's going on, bud? Mike, how are you? Did you enjoy your uh, trip? I enjoyed my trip. It was a little chilly down there, but baseball, basketball, brewskis, it's all good, man. You're living in another world down in that bubble. But uh, while I was Three gone, days. things were happening. Uh, let's start with this with you. Uh, what's the most significant thing that has happened in the week that free agency in terms of either an addition or a loss that they made? That's a great question, Mike. <laughs> um well, I went into the free agent period not thinking that James Bradbury was going to be back, but I did think that C.J. Gardner Johnson would be back. So you give some, you lose some, right? Um, so I, but so my takeaway, I guess, would be that the Eagles were able to maintain their cornerback tandem, starting quarterback tandem, which is is tough, and we can we can spend an hour on just how long it's taken the eagles you know to really have a good cornerback tandem like they won they had last year you'd have to go back to the the Lido and Sheldon days and that was quite a while ago so that i think was pretty significant to be able to bring back James Bradbury at a number that seemed reasonable and um apparently the market just wasn't at, it wasn't bad it just wasn't great for Bradbury as far as 16 17 20 million a year um so that that's good and um, look, I mean, I think that some of these signings are pretty interesting in that they're very low risk, high upside, right? So, um, you know, a guy like Rashad Penny, if he stays healthy, could really be an interesting player in this offense because I think Greg Cosell made the point with us that on our on his show that dropped this morning, the Intel of Greg Cosell, he's actually probably better fit for what they do offensively than even Miles Sanders was, and Miles is coming off a good year. Yeah, I like uh, Penny. If The problem is he's just never healthy. If he can stay healthy, he's an upgrade, I would agree. Um, They bring back Slay and Bradbury, so they do that. Give me your thoughts on the whole C.J. Garner-Johnson thing and what happened with that situation. Somebody brought up an interesting text. Would you have rather used the money that you used on Fletcher Cox and brought back Chauncey Gardner with that money Uh, because it would have been a similar deal that he got in Detroit? But that's not how this all works. Yeah, I mean, not at all. I mean, if the Eagles wanted to match the Lions' offer, and maybe they did uh, or have tried to do, I mean, at six and a half million is not going to make or break any any player on this roster. I mean, they signed Joe Flacco two years ago when they were really up against the cap from that Wentz hit, right? They they signed him for, I think, something like three and a half with a max to make five, and they just wound up adding three dummy years and spreading it all out. So – that wound up being a really interesting saga. And to your point, you're right. You don't look at one. It's not about robbing Peter to pay Paul here. This was about um, a very interesting business decision on both sides. Yeah, it was a very weird situation where the agent tweeted out the offers. And, I mean, it just seemed like uh, it went down a weird path there. Ultimately, though, you just said something that is interesting. If the Eagles wanted to match it, they probably could. Why do we think they were not interested in matching that? Well, I don't know that they didn't. I don't know that they didn't. And CJ just did just decided to take the Lions offer because he knew he knows Dan Campbell, he knows Aaron Glenn, or he's mad at the Eagles organization. I mean, he sat at the podium, no he had no no hard feelings. So I can't really tell you. You know, I, I, I definitely think I know that the their ability to bring back Brad, Bradbury and sort of their another strange situation, their about face on the Darius Slay saga, which turned into Slay getting some more money, probably changed how much they wanted to allocate at the secondary in certain positions. But again, if they wanted to do it and get it done, they could have. So I just know that the Eagles are 
are good at cornerback. Now they're not younger, they're not faster, they're not more dynamic. So that's something to sort of pay attention to. But they obviously have to completely rebuild the middle of their defense, starting up front with losing Javon Hargrave, starting at linebacker, although they've started to do that now. Um, but losing TJ Edwards and Kaiser White and then losing both your starting safeties. Yeah. Uh Jeff Mosher, inside the birds.com, the inside the birds podcast. Um, They did bring in Greedy Williams, too, by the way, a younger player at that cornerback position who at one point was thought to be a pretty, you know, um, you know, a uh, up and coming player has had some injury issues. They went that road, Mosh. They went down the road of a lot of injury guys who had been have been hurt a lot in the past. This is very Howie Roseman s so far. Yeah. And sometimes it's worked out for them and sometimes it hasn't. And that's okay because there's it's low risk high reward, and if they don't work, none of the, because you sign them to one-year deals, it does not guarantee them anything, and it doesn't preclude the organization from drafting and restocking and replenishing at those positions. And if the guys that they bring in, whether it's draft or rookie free agent or trade or whatever, are better, then those guys play. You're not worried about, oh, I signed this guy to a contract, and that, so he's got to play because he's making that much money. So it gives them a lot of optionality which is a smart thing to do. And they've been doing that a lot over the last five, six, seven years. Um, and I think that's that's really the way good organizations work. You know, you fill your holes with free agency. Um, you get one-year deals for guys that you just need kind of veterans or, or depth, right? And you try to build through the draft. And then you add to what you have when you can with free agents who are proven. And they may make a lot of money, but you have a good, strong feeling that they're going to impact you in a positive way. So all their moves to me have made sense so far. You know, they still have a lot of work to do. I think if you looked at the team last year in on March 22nd, yeah. you would say, this is not all that impressive of a team, right? So um, th- it's those additions that come after the first wave of free agency that I think is what helps separate the Eagles from some other teams. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised that both linebackers are not here? No, not at all. Not surprised. Um, we knew TJ Edwards was going to have a good market. You know, he's from Chicago, so even though I thought he, he could get more money, and I don't know, maybe there was a better offer, but the allure of playing for his hometown team, and I didn't think, you know, when I saw the final numbers, I thought, man, the Eagles really could have matched that. But, I don't, you know, I don't know what their plans are as far as resource allocation. You know, it's easy for me to say they could have matched that, they could have matched CJ. You know, they, they have a number in mind, I'm sure, of what it's going to cost them to extend Jalen Hurts, and they have a lot of draft picks, and they know – that they've succeeded at certain positions by being able to put cheap labor in. Um, they like getting compensation picks as well. So that, all those things factor into decisions to let guys leave. Not that they enjoy letting good players leave, but linebacker is a spot where a little more recently they've been able to, to hold their own. And obviously they had to go be Dean, right? And then Nick Morrow is a guy who I, there are things that he does better than Kaiser White. Um, probably more of a uh, overall athlete than Kaiser White is. Um, so in in some regards, I think the Eagles see that as we know every year there's going to be like eight to ten linebackers on the market who are all of equal talent. And I'd rather spend the one-year veteran minimum or whatever than have to try to go multi-year like both of the linebackers got. Yeah. More I money. I, yeah, Morrow is in um... – and Dean, I guess, would be, uh, you know, right now they would be the two guys. We'll see if they end up doing something else there. Uh, obviously, they lost Hargrave as well. And I would imagine, Mosh, right now, the draft is tomorrow. Defensive tackle has to be very high on that list of things that they would do, right? You would imagine. I mean, it all, it's always about how the board falls, right? I mean, uh you know, you're, if you're sitting there at 10 and there are two elite defensive tackles and they're both gone by seven, you're not taking the next DT just because he's a DT, right? There's yep. a corner, there's edge, there's there's a lot of positions that I think that they uh, – offensive line that they would feel comfortable drafting. Yeah, they lost uh, Sayamala as well. And I imagine Jurgens is going to be the guy that uh, ultimately steps in there. They could draft a guy at 10. I've seen some Peter Skronsky buzz – uh, as, as a potential there. Um, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening uh, in that spot. So here we are a week in, and what would you say between now and the draft still is 
something you think will, you know, you could see still being added to the mix. Yeah, well, I, I still think safety is a position to watch for because they really didn't replace C.J. Gardner-Johnson and they didn't have any very good in-house replacements who you feel comfortable with saying, all right, the, like no N'Kobe Deans for linebacker, right? I mean, I, I know that um, the kid played all right last year, Reed Blankenship, but I, I don't believe that they view him as a 100% snap starter, you know, starting safety. So, and I know they signed a kid named uh, – Evans, Jared Evans. Jared, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the guy was out of the ball for three years at one point. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure I'm pretty sure they're not just assuming he's going to stay healthy and be a, a great player for them. So yeah, and, that's always a lot. Now, you know, because next year they're going to have so many picks. The problem is they're going to be comp picks. You're not going to have those picks until next year. Does that preclude them from doing like, like you said, like, they could do something like they did with Chauncey Gardner Johnson last year and find that guy on the last year of his deal and call that team and you know a team that's not very good or a team that's just not going to bring that guy back. They could go down that road again because they know they're going to have a lot of picks next year. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, they've done it more often than people realize over the last, I don't know, five years. I mean, they did it with Tim Jernigan in 2017. They did it with Ronald Darby. Uh, there was another player that they brought in who uh, – was it a trade or – well, uh, you know, obviously we, we just talked about how they did it with CJ. So they're, they're you know, A.J. Brown, sort of an example, three years. The team didn't want to rotate, so they traded for him too. So this is something that the Eagles and Howie pride themselves on finding, you know, talent that's good that for whatever reason is on its way out of somewhere else and beneficial to the Eagles because – it's still usually someone on their rookie deal who's cost efficient and cost and has some control, whether one or two years. Yeah. Um, they also, by the way, we should uh, bring up, they upgraded. Uh, I don't want to say that. Did, did they upgrade their backup <laughs> quarterback position? So I, I sort of had an argument, not an argument, just a, a, a discussion with Greg Cosell on the show that dropped this morning. Cause we went through some free agent signings, including Marcus Mariota. And Greg accurately pointed out that this is a good signing because he can run the offense doing athletic things at the quarterback position, running with the ball, keeping the ball that Jalen Hurts does. So you don't have to change your offense around. Um, but, you know, I was I watched a little bit of Falcons tape last year. I don't remember why. I think they were the Eagles were playing one of the maybe New Orleans or one of the teams they had played. And I saw a couple of those Thursday night games that they happen to be involved with, which helped contribute to why Thursday night games were craptastic. Um, and Mariota was not good. He just wasn't. I don't, you know, I'm, he could, there are times where, you know, sometimes when a quarterback's not good, you don't watch him a whole lot. You wonder if it's the offensive line, is it the coaching, is it the weaponry around him? I don't know. All I know is there were times I saw Kyle Pitts wide open and Mariota missing him by three yards, if not more. Mm -hmm. So I really, it's great that he can run the offense, but every game, Mike, as you know, comes down to not what you do on first down and your RPOs all the time, but you're going to face six, seven, eight, maybe more third downs in a game, and you have to throw the ball and complete it to to move the chains and win. And I did not see a quarterback who could do that really well last year. So it's wonderful that he can give you a nice little keeper for five or six yards on first down, but when it's third and four, third and six, third and eight, can this guy make a play? Because Gardner Minshew could. Um, and I don't. I just don't know if Mariota's got – now, I'm not knocking the signing, by the way, because – you lose a backup quarterback, you have to sign a backup quarterback. And I guarantee you, of all the backup quarterbacks who are still available, whoever the Eagles would have signed, we'd be saying, is this guy any good? Can he throw the ball? Because there are just not that many good quarterbacks to begin with. So I, I'm just saying, looking at Mariota specifically, I, I would have some doubts whether he could go in and have like a 280-yard, two-touchdown type game. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally see your premise there. And, and I was wondering because – I heard nothing that they had any interest in bringing Minshew back. Were they just totally looking to go down a different road, or was his market no. too great? As far as we know, they did want Gardner Minshew back. But Gardner, as most people know, you know, he sees himself – like when he looks in the mirror, he sees Joe Montana, right? We know that. So <laughs> he wanted a chance to go and play and compete for a starting spot or starting time, and that, that wasn't going to be here – Indianapolis, of course, is probably going to draft a quarterback, but you never know. Those guys sometimes, let's say they draft Anthony Richardson, right? And they feel like Richardson needs five or six games to develop. So Gardner gets to start a year. Plus, he's familiar with 
Shane Steichen. It, clearly, there would be more opportunity based on the uncertainty there to get more starting uh, time. Yeah. And then they gave him, a de- you know, they gave him a decent contract. So uh, I, that that to me is the reason why he's not an eagle. Right. So Mariota's in in that spot. You got Rashad Penny back uh, and taking over for Miles Sanders. Those are the two things that have happened on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, and then, of course, we mentioned some of the things that happened on defense. And then uh, you've got the draft coming up. I want to ask you, in your mind right now, uh, is this Eagles team in a better spot than when they left last year? No, of course not. I mean, of course not. But, of course, like I like I said, last year on March 22nd, they weren't in a good spot True. either. So, I mean, True. <laughs> Well, but I will say this. I will say this. They're, they're in a good spot to put up a lot of points because that entire offense is coming back. Whereas last year, I'm glad you, you said didn't have that. Brown. Well, I, I'm yeah, glad you said that because that's what I said. People are like, well, they've lost a lot on defense. And I said, they'll replace defense. They'll find things. They'll do things. But this team is going to be very tough to stop offensively. Absolutely. So they're in a way better spot now than they were at this time last year at this time, just not at the end of this past season, but yeah. they're they're in a really good spot offensively. Okay, so I want to read this text message I got right before you came on. Because okay. I had said somebody tweeted at me. Of course, I'm like the unofficial, like, non-Howie hater. So I had the Howie haters like, how are you going to spin this offseason? In other words, it sounds like people think that maybe he hasn't done that good of a job. So this is an interesting text I got. Says I could see the Howie hate starting all over again. Slay and Bradbury could age like Alshon. No linebackers again. Jordan Davis doesn't get on the field. Dean can't couldn't get in the field. Not a lot of cat space to make moves. The later moves Howie is famous for. The quarterback will be overpaid soon. That's why you can't make big signings. Not saying Howie's doing bad, but can see it going down a path of a similar blueprint of what they did. A couple of years ago, you're shaking your head. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, I'm just, I, I get where I, I understand because yeah. I deal with that as well. Um, nobody can predict the future. Could these moves backfire? Sure. I mean, his moves in 2020 completely backfired. There, there's no doubt about that. That was not a great off season for him. So yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that you can't just take last year and say, oh, these are, this is going to happen every single year. Nick Morrow is going to be as good as whoever, or, uh, you know, like Christian Ellis is going to develop the same way that TJ Edwards did. No, there's, there's no guarantee, but there's still a decent amount of, first of all, there's still a, tr- like we just said, tremendous amount of offensive talent on this team. And will Bradbury and Slay both fall off the face of the earth just like that? Ah, I don't see that. You know, I could, I could have seen it with Alshon because he was a big, guy who was never fast to begin with and he took a lot of hits and he had a shoulder surgery as soon as he got here but Bradbury and Slay have been relatively healthy in fact the Eagles sort of got lucky right because one of our criticisms of them last year going into the year was you got these two corners they're not spring chickens and you have no number three corner no outside corner other than Zach McPherson who's never you never given a shot to Uh, but those two guys stayed healthy all year long so um you know, but but I think that they're in a they're still in a good spot. I think you feel secure with them the way Jalen Hurts is playing. But no, just like nobody saw Carson Wentz falling off the face of the earth. Who, yeah, anything could happen that that would make you say, eh, this isn't exactly how they planned it." But mm. you know, until we get to that point, it's hard to predict. You think anything crazy is uh, is there a move up his sleeve that uh, we don't anticipate that you would say, "Don't be surprised." If this happened, well, I don't have a name, but I did say on the pod before, you know, just like we discussed, you have to look out for Howie always looking for that player who might be on the way out of whatever team for whatever reason, who's got a rookie years left on his contract and can come in here and and do what he couldn't do somewhere else or what, you know, maybe the team just couldn't afford it. There's always that. I mean, not just the Eagles. I know we like to think the Eagles are the only teams that make those moves. It's not the case. A lot of teams do. Um, so I would, yeah, uh, always always look out for something. I, saw, I, I don't think how he's going to go into the year with just this because he only has five draft picks um, right now, right? Okay, Isn't yeah, that, yeah. Uh, um, yes, they have five draft picks. Nothing from what, four, three, four, five, or six, right? Yeah, that's, you know, uh, the, the Howie Roseman I know is not going to allow himself to only have five draft picks and, and take take three through six off. 
Right, I was going to say. there's, Which makes it almost like if you could bet, will the Eagles draft at number 10 or other? You would almost have to say other at this point. You would. Or 30, because 30, there's teams that are calling to try to get that fifth year. And you say, all right, they did this a couple of years ago, and Baltimore ended yes. up taking Lamar Jackson. Right. Exactly. I would almost think that the 30 might be more movable than 10. Yeah. 10, you got to pay a high price to move up for. And if all four quarterbacks are gone by nine, then who's moving up to 10 for who? You know, like, what are you, what are you moving up to 10 for? Um, Interesting question. If Jalen Carter's falling, if he's still there. Now, Carter got a one-year probation and a $1,000 fine. I would imagine teams are not going to be all that worried about that. Now, he might be deemed immature, mm -hmm. but I don't know if he but, falls. You know, I would ask you, what do you think? The Let's say you're at the Eagles are at 10, Jalen Carter's on the board, and whoever's picking 16th wants him. So you want to move up from 16 to 10. You know that the price to pay to move up to 10 for a defensive lineman is different than a quarterback. So, yeah, he's going to, he can add another pick, maybe a, a third round or something, but he's not adding yeah. a haul like you would normally get from moving down ten, for a couple of spots for someone getting a quarterback. True. Yes. Um, you know, and if they take a lineman, if they want an offensive lineman, keep in mind Chicago picks right in front of you now. Yep. That changes the yep. dynamics because I would imagine I would be shocked if they don't take an offensive lineman. In the first round yeah, or just the, at all? The Bears. The Bears at nine. Oh, yeah. The Bears, God, yeah. They don't, well, the Bears are the Bears, man. So I, I don't. <laughs> I don't well, everybody says, well, they need a lot. Well, they spent a ton of money in free agency and still haven't signed an offensive lineman, to my knowledge, anyway. I know it was away, but I don't remember them bringing an offensive lineman in. I thought they signed a guard if I wasn't mistaken. Maybe, maybe I, I could be wrong about right. that. Right. I'm just saying, but they signed a lot. I, I, I mean, Edwards, I mean, I, and that one stood out. Obviously, but I don't remember them. They they've signed a they spent a lot of money. I just don't remember. Hey, wow, they got an offensive line to help out there. They make that trade back to nine. I would right. imagine Paris Johnson or Peter Skronsky is their guy at that spot. Yeah, no, they did sign Nate Davis, a guard from Tennessee, who's a pretty good guard. Yeah. But you're right; they need a tackle, and Skronsky can play both. Now, Skronsky is a guy who's got short arms and projects at guard more so than tackle. But some teams might. Be all right with it, the way they were with Rashawn Slater and uh, Penny Sewell. So we'll have to see. All right. Uh, Inside the Birds podcast. Check that out. Of course, uh, offseason continuing. We're only one week in to free agency. I mean, it started. Feels like, uh, feels like three years right yeah, now. Right. <laughs> it started a week ago today, um, officially anyway. Um, there we go. By the way, uh, Aaron Rodgers tells the Pat McAfee show today he intends to play for the Jets. The compensation is the hold up. This is going to be a great stare down. I can't wait to see uh, this one. All right, bud. We'll talk to you uh, what next week. Sounds great to me, Mike. Have a good one. All right, Jeff Mosher, InsideTheBirds.com, the Inside the Birds podcast.